The contemporary art market is a mess. It's evolved far from its origins as a domain for connoisseurs and aesthetes into a complex it, um, financial ecosystem where art is increasingly <coughs> viewed as an investment, a status symbol, even a form of currency, particularly with free markets. This shift has brought about various practices that both exploit the intrinsic value of art and obscure its cultural significance and, 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 and hide from the public the great works uh, that, that, are, that are caught in banks, in vaults, in um, the free markets, in these strange ports, free ports. A sleeper painting refers to an artwork that's undervalued, misattributed, that's been in private hands, that hasn't been seen, often lying dormant in the market until it is awakened by an astute expert or a dealer who recognises its true value. And this practice of discovering sleepers can be lucrative, of course, but it also introduces a layer of exploitation into the art world where expertise can be wielded as a tool for financial gain rather than the appreciable rather than the appreciation of art. Notable figures like Philip Mould, uh, who've um, been sort of promoting these stories on TV, have been involved in uncovering such sleepers, often turning forgotten or overlooked works of art into high value investments. While this can bring forgotten pieces forgotten masterpieces to light. It also fuels uh, a market driven by profit rather than artistic passion. And the financialization of art has led to the use of offshore banks, free ports as storage spaces where valuable artworks are kept or hidden, often avoiding taxes and other financial obligations. And these free ports located in tax-free zones, uh, of which we've now got a number, serve as warehouses for the ultra-wealthy to store their art collections, sometimes never seeing the light of day or public exhibition. And this practice not only diminishes the cultural accessibility of these works, but also turns art into a commodity, um, a mere entry on a balance sheet rather than a piece of cultural heritage. Will we ever, for example, see the light of the world again, that painting bought uh, allegedly by the... Um, crown prince of Saudi Arabia. The influence of experts in the art market has become increasingly controversial. These individuals who once served as guides to help collectors navigate the world now often act as gatekeepers, controlling both the price and the accessibility of these works of art, of these paintings. The blurring of roles between academics and auctioneers similarly has further complicated matters with figures like James Stunt, who was heavily implicated in the story of 17 paintings which were allegedly forged, and the forger said, oh, I did those. Uh, James Stunt and Philip Mould involved in scandals that question the integrity of the art market. The Stunt-Mould scandal uh, that, uh, that involved these 17 paintings of questionable authenticity that were due to be exhibited by the then Prince Charles, highlights how experts can manipulate market perceptions, create artificial demand, inflate prices for works that may not even be genuine. The traditional roles of auctioneers and academics have become increasingly intertwined, with auction houses now serving not only as marketplaces but also as arbiters of taste and authenticity. And this dual role that they play raises concerns about conflict of interest, where the objective scholarship of academics can be compromised by the commercial interests of auction houses. The involvement of Philip Mould, this respected dealer and television presenter, um, fake or fortune, in the scandal surrounding James Stunt, the art dealer with a dubious reputation, exemplifies the tension. Stunt, who has been accused of being involved in the sale of counterfeit paintings, claims that many of the works he traded were created by a forger, um, and that further complicates the narrative. Michael Findlay, another veteran art dealer who began his career in the 1960s, provides a poignant contrast uh, to 
the current state of the art market, when Findlay arrived in New York, the idea of an art market was almost non-existent, with art being appreciated for its cultural and aesthetic value rather than its financial potential. But today the market is dominated by financial considerations, with art being bought and sold like stocks, often without the buyer even seeing the piece of art in person. The rise of art advisors, investment funds and other financial instruments has transformed the way art is traded, understood, often at the expense of artists and the art itself. Findlay's reflections on the past, where personal hardship between dealers and collectors were paramount, underscores the impersonal and transactional nature of the art world today in today's market. The shift from a passion-driven uh, marketplace to one focused on profit is evident in the practices of sending paintings straight to storage only to be shown as digital images at dinner parties, a stark contrast to the vibrant, artist-driven scene of the 1960s. It's the commodification of art that's led to a market where the cultural and aesthetic value of art itself is overshadowed by its financial potential. The trade in sleeper paintings, the use of offshore banks, free ports, the manipulation of the market by experts, and auctioneers all contribute to a system where art is increasingly seen as an asset rather than a cultural treasure. And as figures like Philip Mould and James Stunt demonstrate, the commodification of art can lead to scandals that undermine the integrity of the system, raising questions about the true value of the art we collect and preserve. And the, um, the abuse of authority the challenge for the future will be to find a balance between appreciating art for its cultural significance and navigating the realities of a market-driven world that sees it simply as pounds in the pocket.